I think a lot of people who are in this space, in this industry, who have some type of online presence or social following, they are they are intimidated uh, on some level by the other people out there who are eight percent body fat, who do have like twenty two inch arms, uh, who have amazing stage ready bodybuilding picks, having muscle intelligence, having uh, training. Um, knowledge to share with other people doesn't mean you have to also be 8% body fat year round or ever. We believe that you are strong by design and you were made in God's image to have a strong body, mind, and spirit. You're listening to the number one strength and health authority podcast in the world. So let's get ready to unlock your potential and transform your life in today's episode. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Strong by Design podcast, hosting today, Coach Chris, and I am interviewing myself today. (laughs) Uh, This is a a long time coming solo episode. I've been meaning to do this topic for a while, and uh, it's just been something that um, has been in my head, kind of rattling around for for a bit. Wasn't sure if it was a better as a conversation or better just as a kind of a, me kind of going deep on this with just my own thoughts and feelings about it. And um, so I'm just going to roll. And um, so I thank you for joining me today. Thank you for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. Hope today's not uh, your first ever listen to the podcast, but if it is, we welcome you. Thank you so much for for landing on today's show. Uh, you're probably interested in in this topic, uh, particularly uh, fitness and strength and muscle, uh, which is certainly a big part of our audience. Uh, while a lot of people listen to us for other reasons, because we talk about family, we talk about God, we talk about health, holistic health, um, uh, just a little bit of everything. And um, ultimately, this is Critical Bench's podcast, and we believe that you are strong by design, created in God's image, to have a strong body, mind, and spirit. And so some of our episodes touch on all three of those elements. Some episodes touch on just one. And today I'm kind of going deep on the one, really living in the fitness area here uh, today, talking about, as I said, something that I've been thinking about on some level, maybe wasn't always sure how to articulate it. And I made some notes for myself so that I could kind of remember where I wanted to go with this. And um, I wonder if if you listening have struggled with this before as well. Um, I've been around the scene in the, in the fitness and strength scene for a number of years since middle late nineties. So, uh, my background as a fitness expert, I go by coach Chris or uh, as a, as a strength coach, longtime strength coach here at critical bench since 2013. And, uh, prior to that, 15 years of working as a personal trainer and strength coach with the public uh, in face-to-face environments, uh, which has looked different. But where did all of that uh, influence come from, my interest in in lifting at all? Well, it came from my childhood and really mostly my older brothers, my big brothers, certainly a little bit from my father as well, who's always into uh, working out and staying fit and strong. But my older brother is five years older than me, identical twins. um, And they were uh, just awesome, amazing big brothers. I've mentioned them before. My one brother, Bob, has been uh, a guest on the show before. And uh, they were a huge influence for me. I really looked up to them. Uh, I have a great relationship with my brother, Bob. Unfortunately, my brother, Dave, passed away several years ago to brain cancer. And, um, so, but I think about them every single day, uh, pictures of my brothers, uh, the three of us together all around my office and, um, just, they were wonderful, um, big brothers and they were always fit and athletic and strong and uh, looked out for their little brother, me, the pain in the ass, (laughs) 
but they were certainly my biggest influences growing up. And I started working out probably around 10 years old because they were working out as 15 year olds in high school, getting ready for football. And, uh, that really got that carried with me. I always liked being kind of strong and, and tough and uh, making sure everybody else knew I was strong and tough. <laughs> I was uh, always a talker, still am today, uh, but I, I typically always backed it up. I mean, I always participated in, I played Pop Warner football, and Little League baseball. That was my childhood. And uh, once I got into high school, football and lifting weights kind of became everything. And, um, that carried with me all the way into college, continued to stay super fit and strong in college, lived in the, in the uh, fitness center on campus, as well as the, uh, the garage I had in a house off campus I lived in with my older brothers, actually, and uh, I converted the garage basically into my uh, fitness uh, gym or fitness center, if you will, a heavy bag in there and some uh, some loose weights, dumbbells, barbell, plate weight stuff and would listen to the Rocky Four soundtrack. Yes, I'm willing to say that, along with lots of other good heavy metal music and hard rock and 70s and 80s music and 90s even. Um, but uh, loved being strong and fit uh, through college. Of course, I was a hack lifter like most guys uh, took what I learned from high school, you know, from some of the strength coaches we had and just kind of ran with it, kind of did training my own way. But I'll say that my, my first big influence, uh, which led to this as a career was upon graduation of college in 1998. Um, and I got my first fitness job uh, working at a world gym in Stanford, Stanford, Connecticut. And, uh, I was working at the desk <laughs> at the front desk and was exposed to a lot of just meat, great meatheads, uh, and a lot of really smart, uh, strength coaches and personal trainers that I was surrounded with and competitors. And they were, they were all in, in their own way, uh, influences on me. But a few in particular, which I'll get to kind of at the end, I, I'm going to list out my five biggest influences. But um, they, I, I learned a lot from them uh, in conversation and watching them train, their discipline with their diet, uh, all kinds of things. Um, and that was – I really grew a lot from, say, 98 to 2000, being around that atmosphere on a regular basis every day. Um, I, I worked – what felt like seven days a week and uh, just closing opening shifts, getting to the gym at 5 a.m. to open. And uh, it, it was a fun, fun time in my early 20s. Uh, made a lot of friends. And uh, yeah, it's fun to, to think back at that time what I was doing. And uh, so I started, uh, you know, working at the desk, I, I started to train people through, you know, uh, just being a member of uh, or a, a, a team member of the, of the club and eventually led to me going and getting certified, going to workshops and, and, and doing some uh, training, in-person trainings uh, to be able to, uh, to train people and carry my own personal training insurance and all of that stuff. So sometimes people will say like, okay, well, what makes you a fitness expert? They'll ask that question. Um, I've been asked that question before many times through our YouTube content or other, other social platforms um, inside our help desk. <laughs> and uh, it's like anything else, what makes people an expert in something typically is the amount of time they have dedicated to that particular thing, that, that craft, uh, you could call it the 10,000 hour, hour rule if you, if you want. Um, so after spending obviously a huge portion of my life up to that point into the early two thousands working out, then surrounding myself with those people working in that environment, 45, 55 hours a week, uh, after several years of doing that, uh, eventually, I mean, by 2013, when I, I took a job with Critical Bench, yeah, I mean, 15 years of working 
in the fitness space, training clients, uh, being a general manager of a fitness and health center for several years. Um, yeah, you, you become an expert. I, I led people. Uh, I was the head trainer and looked after the personal training program at, at a facility that I was general manager of. So eventually you're just, you're well learned. You have lots of experience behind you and, uh, the passion has to still be there. Um, you know, you can be an expert or have expertise in something, but if you're not passionate about it, I don't know how, uh, how powerful it'll be or how well received it'll be from people that are, are trying to learn from you. So I, I've always prided myself and my enthusiasm and my passion in the work that I do. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, I mean, I, I was first certified with the uh, National Academy of Sports Medicine or NASM back in the day. And a uh, funny fact, Jay Cutler, four-time Mr. Olympia, was in my, uh, my NASM certification uh, three- or four-day uh, workshop. This was in person in Norwalk, Connecticut. It was at the Double Tree Hotel. I still remember. And Jay was kind of a nobody at that point. People probably in Connecticut knew who he was, but not so much nationally. As, you know, but uh, soon after that, obviously, he became a monster and uh, started competing against Ronnie for uh, Mr. Olympia titles. So that was fun, him doing some guest posing, taking his shirt off. Everybody got to I mean, he was wide. I felt bigger than him because I'm, I was a lot taller. But, I mean, he was just as wide as a doorway. Uh, just, just a monster, and uh, you know, uh, obviously, really uh, fun uh, bodybuilding competitor for many, many years uh, uh, to follow. All right, so really, what I want to dig into here are the perceptions that are associated with fitness gurus and popular experts, right? So if, if I've, I'm declaring myself a fitness expert. At this stage of my life, I'm 48 years old. I've been working in this field since I was 21 years old. So it's, it's, a, it's a long time. And I've been surrounded by a lot of very knowledgeable, very sharp, uh, highly accomplished athletes in the world of bodybuilding, powerlifting, uh, and uh, coaching. And so... Um, but one thing I want to I want to uh, discuss here, and why I don't need anybody else <laughs> to to like ask me layup type questions is like I've never been super ripped, never. I don't think I've ever been under ten percent body fat. Uh, I maybe m mistakenly I was once. I've never competed in a powerlifting meet. I have never competed in a bodybuilding um, event, nor did I ever really have the desire to. I've competed in other types of events and stuff like, you know, mud runs and, and uh, adventure races and stuff like that just because they're fun. Uh, but I, I never felt the, the strong pull to do it, okay? I never felt like I had to do it in order to still be received as a an expert or or a coach that could be helpful to somebody. Uh, most of the people I worked with were beginner to intermediate level uh, athletes or 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 you know men and women. They were not um, you know pro athletes or seeking any type of pro level uh, in their training. These were more affluent people typically or kids of affluent people that were maybe on their way to college and preparing uh, as, as young athletes for their sport. Or these were people that were probably plus side of 30, 35 to probably say 65 that were very serious about their health and fitness and wanted somebody that would A, motivate them, B, show up, and C, uh, teach them proper technique and put together a fun workout program that that they could follow. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. Um, I don't know that just because you're huge and shredded 
that that makes you a better trainer. I, I, I in in my assessment, no. I, I think you you're either good or you're not, regardless of like your eight percent body fat or your fifteen percent body fat. That's a discipline thing, uh, or that's a, a a want thing. It's hard to get to eight percent body fat. I'll tell you that much because I've seen other people do it, and I know how incredibly difficult that is, especially to maintain that. Um, I don't know how much time in my life I've spent between 10 and 15% body fat, probably certain periods. So even since I've worked here, you can go back. Uh, I'll share uh, on the YouTube video for this podcast. I'll share some old clips of me when I was leaner, um, you know, over 10 years ago or thereabouts when I did some shirtless content and stuff. And if you go back prior to that, I mean, I was 36 years old making YouTube videos. I've, I've been leaner than that in my life. It just wasn't on record, right? <laughs> Social media and all that stuff hadn't been around for a heck of a lot, uh, you know, in my 20s, if at all. So I don't have a lot of that stuff to like, you know, make me more credible as a, a ripped uh, strength coach. Um, at the same time, so people are one, and I know I'm all over the place, but this is just the way I talk, right? A mile a minute. Um, if you're wondering like, well, what, how's, how big are you? I'm 5'11 and I fluctuate from generally 205 to 220 pounds. I have been, I mean, just three years ago, I lost a bunch of weight just because I was doing, uh, I was I was working with uh, one of our good friends, Will Grazione, and <clears throat> really dialing in, trying to see how low I could get to. And I got down to 191, and I forget what my body fat percentage was. But it, it dropped significantly uh, into, like, the middle teens. And so, yeah, probably about 15% body fat at, that would have been 45 years old. And I felt... You know, I felt like you could see stomach muscles and I felt good definition through my shoulders and arms. And I'm like, I mean, it was hard. It was hard to hold myself to 2,150 calories a day, um, you know, weighing all my food and doing I did all that for five months. And I'm like, geez, if I kept going, yeah, I could probably lose another 10 pounds and really get s sliced. But I just didn't have the desire to continue doing that. I mean, you really have to want it to maintain a much lower uh, body fat percentage. And if you're all into the aesthetics of it, and when you're younger, certainly that was more important to me. I'm married with two children, a 13-year-old and an almost 13-year-old. By the time this releases, he'll, he'll just about be 13. And a nine-year-old daughter, and I've been married for 20 years. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not getting ready for the stage. So, you know... Uh, it's, it just doesn't have that kind of importance to me right now. Um, I'll say having muscle intelligence, having, uh, training, um, knowledge to share with other people doesn't mean you have to also be 8% body fat year round or ever, uh, look like, or be a stage ready competitor or have a huge bench squat or deadlift. Like in my life, I've never squatted probably more than 405. Well, no, I think once I, I was in the mid four, so maybe like 460. I mean, this is going back again into my 20s when I was pushing the, the limits. Probably 465, probably deadlifting about the same, and I don't think I've ever benched more than probably 365 pounds. Now, those numbers to a beginner would sound probably pretty impressive, but to a competitive power lifter or a big-time bodybuilder, those are not very impressive numbers. But I've also mostly maintained an injury-free body up until earlier this past year when I actually, probably from coaching baseball, I had a tear in my meniscus on my right knee and had to get it repaired. Uh, and it feels much better and I'm fully recovered and back to 
being really active and doing everything I want to do. But I don't have any shoulder issues. I don't have. I've never torn my pec. I've never torn my bicep. Um, I've never dealt with a lot of these other issues that that people that lift extremely heavy loads or, and this is another topic, are using uh, anabolic steroids or GH and stuff, uh, are using those things to accomplish those big goals that they have, to push the envelope, to push the limits of what they're capable of. Certainly, synthetically, we are able to, to do that. I've never wanted... I've always wanted to maintain that kind of just natural status. And I think looking at me and most people would never, there's been a few people over the years when I did get leaner that would maybe think just people I knew in my personal life, maybe people thought that maybe I was doing a little something. Um, but I've never done it. I've never had real interest in it. I've always thought to myself, wow, I, I could probably be a real freak of nature if I did do stuff. Um, I don't know what my body would be capable capable of, but at this stage of my life, I mean, I'm a year and a half away from being 50 years old. I, I don't have any desire to mess with that stuff because I also have seen the other side of it. Um, and people have very short life expectancy when they get heavily involved in using synthetics and, and things. Um, and the, the abuse that it has on, on your body, the toll that it takes is pretty significant. So another point that I wanted to make with this too is I think a lot of people who are in this space, in this industry, who have some type of online presence or social following, they are, they are intimidated uh, on some level by the other people out there who are 8% body fat, who do have like 22 inch arms, uh, who have, you know, amazing stage ready bodybuilding picks or awesome numbers, uh, from powerlifting or whatever. And that can be very much intimidating to people who are in their own right, fitness enthusiasts who've done a lot of work at it, who, who are passionate about it, who've invested years of, and, dedicated a lot of their time and energy to something that they love being fit while at the same time they don't have this hardened physique that is uh just a jaw jaw dropper for people they just gets a lot of followers i mean i have me personally have very little following like my instagram has like 800 people on it <laughs> okay people don't real they don't follow me because i'm not doing any like flips i'm not you know benching 600 pounds. I'm not doing a, a, a single leg pistol squat standing on top of a freaking brick or something. You know, I, I'm not doing tricks. And, uh, and that's cool if you do that and have a big following. I have people like that that I've followed or I've learned from. They can do amazing things. That's awesome for them. I think my whole thing, uh, and I, I remember hearing this from some clients that I worked with back in my early 20s, and I'll, me I'll mention this place later, Body Tuning in uh, Darien, Connecticut, when I worked for Ben Prentice, who has an amazing uh, hockey performance uh, center up in uh, Stanford, Connecticut. But I used to hear from clients that they preferred training with me over other uh, coaches and, and trainers at Body Tuning because they just enjoyed the time they spent with me for that hour. Not that they, not that they just got a good workout that I pushed them, that I motivated them. They just enjoyed the conversation. They enjoyed the, um, the back and forth nature of that time together. And that's a, a big part of working in this space is you can't be a robot. You can have all the information up in your brain, but if you're not personable, if you don't, if you're not interested in other people, if you're not a good listener, you are not going to succeed. You are not going to have a big following. You're not going to generate uh, a, a lot of uh, sessions or a, a lot of clients. Um, you have to be, uh, you have to come from a place of service. But you, I mean, it's like our seven core values that are hanging on my wall over here, here at Critical Bench. We have seven core values, and positive attitude is one of them. The other six, are integrity, gratitude, service, 
um, uh, passion, of course. I thought I said passion first. That's the other P. Um, and then decisiveness and faith. And those seven things together are really complementary and really kind of create the perfect storm of, of, of an individual. And, but that, that, that those two P's, the positive attitude and the passion, that's what attracts people. You have to be kind of magnetic in a way. And I think if you don't have that, even if you have all the smarts and all the know-how and all the experience, um, you're, you're going to lose people and, and probably not have a successful business. Um, and so those are two, you know, foundational values that, that we, um, hire and fire, um, with here at critical bench. And those are two things that always seem to come easier to me. And I think it really helped me in my, um, in my, along the way on my journey of personal training and working with other people, they could tell that I had a real natural, authentic, um, care for them and that I also really loved the training and they would see me in my own workouts and stuff, maybe on off days where they didn't have a session with me and they'd see me pushing myself and enjoying it. And so it just felt more real to them. Um, so I don't know. So the, the, what I wanted to touch on earlier briefly was that healthy and fit to be healthy, truly healthy, and to be fit and to be strong um, doesn't mean that you're on anabolic steroids, on growth hormone, on uh, TRT, uh, right, which is testosterone replacement therapy. Now, there might be a real need for some of you out there if you get tested and your testosterone level is really low, then there might be a need for you to do TRT. There might need, be a need for you if you're highly competitive and you, you're, you're struggling to get lean enough or you might get some of the size. You, you might personally find it a necessity to do some type of anabolic steroids. And there's a whole host of them. I'm sure some of you listening know five off the top of your head. Um, but, you know, I, I think I have a screen up over here with some of them. Oral steroids, Anadrol. Uh, Oxandrin, Dianabol, Winstrol, right? Decadurabolin, Durabolin, uh, Depo testosterone, uh, you know, so all, all, all these different ones that, that exist out there that people have used, still use, uh, you know, whether they're being prescribed uh, or you're getting them illegally, <laughs> uh, whatever that is. I mean, I've been, I've been around it. I've seen things. Um, just never had interest in doing those things because I always felt like, you know, I feel good, I look good. Um, I'm 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 not trying to get, you know, in a in a bikini bottom and get on stage. I'm not trying to put on a singlet and like deadlift or squat or bench press. Um, so if if I'm not trying to do either one of those things competitively, then why would I? all this stuff into my, into my system. Um, I don't know. That's just mine. That's just my way of looking at it. Um, you can do what you want. It's your body. Right. But, uh, for me, I never felt I needed those things in order to be successful at what I chose to do and, and, and coaching people and, and being a personal trainer for all those years. So, um, so as I said, I'm kind of all over the map, but it's just like me talking about a particular topic where I feel like there's just so much out there where you got to look a certain way, you got to present yourself a certain way in just in order to get the, the respect and, and the credibility factor. But um, I, I, I don't know. I, you, you might completely disagree with my assessment. <laughs> uh, you might think, no. You got to be at least 10% body fat. You have to at least be able to do this, this, and this in order to qualify as a legitimate fitness expert. But I think my resume speaks for itself and the people that I've, I've been around and worked with over the years. So speaking of that, the five biggest influences in, in my world in muscle and strength building, number one 
this was a guy that I got clients from that I met in 1998 at World Gym. And uh, he had uh, a personal training business that he operated out of this World Gym chain. And this man's name is Lloyd Weinstein. And uh, he was so impressive to me back in the days. So one of the nicest guys you ever met. I got to reach out to him. I, I haven't talked to this man in like 20 years. Um, I, I, he is a three-time world and 16-time national powerlifting champion. He was on the cover of Powerlifting uh, USA magazine back in the 80s. Um, a monster. I remember him in the late 90s when he was entering a, a world master's uh, meet that was going to be in South Africa. And I remember him training for that. And I remember him, I would talk with Lloyd a lot. I mean, I, I got clients from him. And I remember one day when he was in training for this event and he had me come over and spot him doing some squats and um, he was doing triples. This guy is 155 pounds. He's doing triples with like 400 and 50 something pounds on the bar. I mean, and he was doing triple sets. So three reps. And I just remember spotting with him the depth and the precision of his squat and how well he moved that weight for three reps. And I just remember like, that's what I need to look like when I squat. So talk about a big influence, man. This guy was like the nicest guy you ever met, 155 pounds squatting three times his body weight for a triple beautifully. I mean, there's not a lot of people on the planet that can do that kind of thing. And so he was just a huge influence on me. His numbers actually, he's 100, about 155 pounds, I said. He squatted 551, one rep max, benched 325, and deadlifted 606. This guy pulled more than three times his body weight. He, om he pretty much pulled four times his body weight. That's like obscene. Not a lot of people like ever have, have done such a thing. Cause think about like a kind of a typical power lifter, right? In a higher weight class, that's 250 pounds. A lot of those guys, they're not deadlifting, squatting, benching anywhere near, or no, take benching out of that. Most people don't bench uh, that much, right? Uh, squ squatting and deadlifting, like maybe double their, their weight to maybe three times, but certainly not four times their weight. That's unbelievable. So Lloyd, if you ever listen to this episode, props to you, man. I've brought you up before in past episodes, I think, but uh, you, were, you were legendary and uh, such a great human being. I'll have to reach back out to you. Ben Prentice, who I podcasted with a few years back on our show, you go back and listen to that episode. Just search his name, Prentice, P-R-E-N-T-I-S-S. The name of his, uh, his uh, business is Prentice Hockey Performance. That's in Stanford, Connecticut. He works with uh, NHL players. He's worked with lots of different athletes over the years. He was just starting to do a lot of that work in the early 2000s, uh, back when I worked for him from 2000 to uh, almost the end of 2002. And um, that's where I met uh, another big influence, which is Charles Poliquin. And Charles um, was quite the character. He's a Canadian strength coach. He's, he's now deceased. He passed away about six years ago. Uh, he's an author and trained several uh, Olympic and pro athletes. And uh, Charles was uh, brilliant, uh, had a very interesting personality. And he would come to our place uh, to body tuning in Darien, Connecticut. And uh, Ben was a bit of a mentor of his and, and Ben started doing some work for him. And uh, I think that's really what kind of kicked off or led Ben on this journey of working with high-level athletes and still to this day does that work. And um, But Charles was uh, – he would come and visit often, and we, we did, did some workshops with him. He would teach us stuff, had some interesting conversations and, and lunches with him back in, the, uh, in that time. And I was – you know, very influential. Those were my, my early mid twenties, you know, so I was, I was really just every, I, I, I ate and slept, uh, in the gym pretty much, <laughs> pretty much, especially when I was working a body tuning, I would take naps there. All my meals were there. I was there from five in the morning until eight at night, five days a week and a half day on Saturday. So uh, that was a good time, fun time. 
back in the back in the day. Uh, beyond those two gentlemen, two other gentlemen, uh, Mike Willie, who is a, uh, a kettlebell expert master. He's unbelievable. He's a strong first team leader. Uh, he's FMS two certified. He's CSCS. He uh, is really truly largely responsible for me getting uh, kettlebell certified RKC back in 2013. If it hadn't been for the, all the work that I did with him for about a six month period, uh, I certainly never would have gotten certified. Just working with technique and form and, and building up strength and training with him on a weekly basis. Um, he was, uh, you know, a huge part of our uh, success at, a, at our workshop that we went to in Tallahassee back then. And then, um, there's videos of me doing my snatch test on YouTube. Uh, there, it took me several several times, but if you think it's easy to sling a 53-pound or 24-kilo kettlebell over your head 100 times in five minutes, then you must be somebody special because it's one of the harder things I've ever done in my life uh, was passing that particular part of the certification process was the snatch test. All, everything else kind of felt pretty easy, but that was very, very hard, um, especially having not really had a, much of a kettlebell background prior to that. Man, that was fun. But I, I still like doing kettlebell work because it's such a challenge. Um, it is not for the faint of heart to be good with a kettlebell. I have a lot of kettlebell content on our uh, YouTube channel over the years, too. And last but not least, certainly not least, is my uh, longtime friend and mentor uh, and boss here at Critical Bench, Mike Westerdahl. We've been friends since the early 90s, 91, when he moved uh, to Connecticut, and we became uh, instant friends over the summer before, during football season, our sophomore year in high school. And uh, Mike went on to have quite a powerlifting career in the uh, – later 2000s, I think about 06 to about 09 or 2010, he was competitive. He ended up having a 630 pound bench in competition. And uh, not too long after that, we got seriously talking and I ended up getting hired on as a strength coach and content creator here at Critical Bench. And I blinked and now it's 2024. <laughs> And here we are seven years into a podcast, so unbelievable. So Mike has been a huge influence in my life, um, and um, you know I'm grateful for his friendship and, of course, the opportunity to work here at Critical Bench and to share my thoughts and feelings with, with uh, our amazing listeners. Uh, and then last but not least, certainly I said five, but this is kind of a general one, just coworkers and friends who have competed – uh, the magazines and stuff I used to read back in the 80s and 90s, um, authors and speakers and different pro athletes that I've met. I mean, I think back in the, uh, when I first moved to Florida in 2002, I became friendly with Darren Charles, who's an amazing uh, IFBB pro competitor. Uh, we used to talk daily because he had clients at Fitness First over in Fort Lauderdale, Connecticut, Deerfield Beach, uh, Connecticut, or Florida where um, I started working with clients when I first moved to Florida. Um, who else was I? Been? I've been friendly. Uh, years back, we used to do a lot of filming with uh, BPAC, Ben Pakulski. Uh, learned a lot from him, and um, you know, just brilliant guy. Uh, obviously, high-level, top-10 type IFBB pro in his day, and uh, still continuing to do a lot of educating and uh, podcasting and, and, and stuff. And uh, in fact, the dumbbells we have, we bought off him from his MI40 gym uh, back when we started the compound here seven years ago, pretty fun, eight years ago. Uh, so anyway, I've been around a lot of these folks over the years and really um, listened to them a lot and learned a lot from them. So that has led uh, certainly to my expertise in this field. And uh, my passion has never ended. Uh, I still look forward to a workout. Like I'm already planning my workout for today in my head, and what I'm going to do, and what do I need to do, where am I weak, what haven't I done in a while, what uh, you know, I'm always kind of on the lookout for, uh, the kind of that mental assessment, not what I want to do, but what I need to do. 
And I do try to start most of my workouts with about 10 minutes of something I don't like, like that damn fan bike. Riding on a fan bike with that resistance high is not pleasurable by any means. But if I push myself hard and do it for 10 minutes, which is equivalent of about two or three songs that I like, um, I can push through it. And then everything else after that is a cakewalk. So uh, anyway, final remarks, okay? Let's let's wrap this baby up. Uh, I will say this. Nutrition, I believe, is 75 to 80% of your overall physical success. So the body that you dream of, the body that you want, Three quarters or more of the work to get there is going to be what you're consuming, what you're putting in your body. I think rest and recovery equates to about 10 or 15% of that overall success and physique, which doesn't leave a lot of room for the other thing that everyone makes the most important, which is your actual strength training. Yes, it's important, but how many hours in a week are you investing in exercise? versus how many hours a week are you investing in what you're eating and your sleep, right, and your rest and recovery. You're invested a whole hell of a lot more in those those areas than you are in the actual workout and training. Now, you can be a little bit more um, thoughtful when it comes to creating your programming and the workouts you're going to follow, but ultimately it's a handful of hours, five to ten hours in a whole week that you're going to be exercising versus, um, you know, having three square full meals every single day, uh, hydrating properly, resting properly, getting quality sleep, all those other things that play such a huge role. So it really comes down to where your focus is, where your discipline is, and uh, how disciplined are you in those things. If you really want to get change your physique. You got to change your eating habits. I'm speaking to myself there too. Uh, Another thing is surround yourself with the type of lifestyle and success and physique that you wish to have. You know, people have said this for years. You're the average of the five people you spend the, the most time with. And that's very true. So who are you investing your time in or with? Uh, what podcasts uh, are you listening to? What books are you reading? What videos are you watching? Those are influences on you. So, you know, be smart. Choose wisely, as they say. Uh, I mean, if you hang out with drug users and drinkers, lazy people, people who are, aren't goal-oriented, who don't have goals, you'll probably never get the body or the mindset that you're seeking. Um, last couple things. Every day is a new opportunity because we're so good at beating ourselves up for bad choices yesterday. Every day is a new opportunity to get it right. Remind yourself of that because we we are our own worst critics. So the long-lasting habits and the consistency will always win the day. Being disciplined regardless of what it is you're chasing is by far the most vital to your success. So you got to make physical movement and proper nutrition a priority and incorporate the baby steps every time you're adopting a new habit. So start small and build on it. Start small. Don't bite off more than you can chew if you really want it to stick. If it's a brand new thing, it feels a little funky in the beginning, a little awkward, not super like just part of your day yet. In order to make it part of your day, like get up 10 minutes earlier if you're trying to do more stuff in early in the day, right? Or go to bed 10 minutes earlier or 20 minutes earlier, whatever. It's micro changes, not these big massive corrections. They never seem to last, right? So go at it small, find success with that, and then you can continue to modify, make changes as you go. Lastly, which I already mentioned is my 10 minutes of hated exercises to begin my workout. Uh, That's something that I've adopted, and I really enjoy doing that. Uh, It's like a pat on the back. Once that's done, I'm like, man, the rest of this workout's cakewalk. Uh, I've gotten a lot better in recent times skipping chips and snacks and crap I don't need to get me through the day, just focusing on my breakfast, on my main courses, my breakfast, my lunch, my dinner, and then how clean can I be for those three things. Uh, like, for example, what did I ate today, I had three eggs with two little sausages. That was my breakfast. I didn't need the bread. I had some cups of coffee with that and a huge glass of water. Uh, my lunch today was I had 
cut up two fresh nectarines that were delicious. Nectarines kind of like a peach. Had sex with a, another fruit. I forget what fruit that would be. Anyway, oh, man, so good. And with like three big chicken sausage things that my wife cooked up that are really good. And that was my lunch. And you know what's really cool is like eating until you're 80% satisfied, still being like a little hungry. And that's when you stop eating. Stop eating when you're not full, right? Stop eating before you get there, okay? Go to bed a little hungry. That's okay. Drink a little cup of water. Sometimes I have a little half cup of milk uh, just to wash down like my nighttime vitamins just as like a guilty pleasure, if you will, a little half glass of whole milk uh, if if I need a little something, something. But the the less eating you do after... Seven, eight o'clock at night, the better, because you usually don't need those calories much anymore, unless you had a long day and you just haven't eaten much all day. Uh, and lastly, of course, drink a ton of water. It's really hard to drink too much. Speaking of that, I need a sip. Super, super hard to drink too much water. Could it be done? Sure, it can be done. But most people don't overconsume water. Most people are walking around dehydrated. I think the stats somewhere in the 80 to 90 percentile uh, of, of people walking around dehydrated, constant state of dehydration. So if you have a headache, drink more water. If you feel a little fuzzy, a little woozy, drink more water. I start every day with water and I end every day with water and a lot in between. Um, so anyway, that's my take on some stuff. Said some good things today, I think. Said some weird stuff, uh, some forgettable things, and maybe some memorable things. Hopefully you got something out of this. <laughs> I haven't done a, a solo episode in quite a while, but I do want to get back to doing more of these. As I, I've also told Jared, we've got to get you doing some solos. So look forward to some of those coming from Jared uh, in the coming weeks and months. So I just appreciate you tuning in today to the Strong by Design podcast. It's always a pleasure. Um, I have a lot to say, a lot's going around on, on, in my brain. And so it feels good to just have this platform to get those things out and to hopefully connect with people on the other side who have those same thoughts and feelings. Uh, so hope you enjoyed this. Please leave a rating or a review. Share this episode with a friend. Uh, or family member or somebody. Uh, we greatly appreciate it here at Critical Bench. I'll be talking with you really soon. God bless. Thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. If you found value in today's episode, please subscribe so that more people can find out about our show. Plus, you don't want to miss any future episodes with the amazing guests and topics we have lined up for you. 